Lord, we thank you so much for your faithfulness. We pray you bless us today. Pray you speak to us and challenge our hearts. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let's see your Bibles. One more time, let's see you loud. Hands. Lesson plan. Let's turn to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 1. We're starting a new series today through the book of 1 Samuel. First Samuel chapter 1. A week ago tomorrow, two weeks ago tomorrow, I got back from a crusade in Jamaica. We had a fantastic time. And I had left San Diego about a week before I ended up getting to Jamaica. And I had to go to uh, a, a few other places first. I ended up flying, taking off and landing 12 times. I flew from here to Sacramento, spoke, spent the night, flew to Dallas, Miami, spent the night, flew to Trinidad, spent the night, three nights, Flew to Barbados, St. Martin, and then back to Kingston, spent the night. Flew to Montego Bay, spent the night for about five days. Then went to back to Kingston, spent the night. Then went to Miami, San Diego, uh, L.A., and home. And so in those 12 days, I landed and, landed and took off 12 times. I got to fly in a helicopter. How many of y'all do not like helicopters? Okay, we had this helicopter. It was a four-seater with a glass bottom so you could see out the bottom. It was, but we flew from Kingston to Montego Bay over the mountains of Jamaica and then down the coast. It was unbelievable. Matter of fact, we were going between the mountains, like, you know, in the valley, banking like this. It was, it was beautiful. Got over the uh, water. You could see fish in the water. Uh, but anyway, in every single one of the airports that I was in, it was 12 of them, every person in the airport was either coming from somewhere, everyone would say from, or going to somewhere, say to. They were either going from, coming from somewhere, say from, or going to somewhere, say to. Say from, to. Say, 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 some of you said Tom. <laughs> say from, to. Now every time you come to a church service, the people in the service are coming from someplace spiritually hopefully going to someplace spiritually. Now, I know some people come to church because they just need to check the box that they went. In other words, I got to go to church. I'm not going to get anything. I don't want to change. I'm fine with my life. I just want to do my duty for God. I would challenge you not to have that attitude, that you give, cheat yourself on a great opportunity to learn something. But anyway, most people will come to church, hopefully wanting to learn something. So they're coming from a spiritual place, going to a spiritual place. The series through the book of Samuel is called From To. Why? Because in this book, we see a transition taking place of a lot of different things. Let's, and before we get into that, let's do a little review. Everyone get in your quiz position. Quiz position to put your booty back. Tell the person next to you, put your booty back. <coughs> Just give you a little context of the book of 1 Samuel. Everyone say Genesis. Genesis. Say Exodus. Exodus. Say Leviticus. Exodus. Say Numbers. Say Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Say it by yourself. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, say, it, say it with confidence and conviction. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, there we go. And then we got to Deuteronomy. They were in plains of what? Boaz. In the plains of what? Boaz. And then three words that start with J, Jordan, Joshua, and Judges. After they were in the plains of Moab and they went to the promised land, they crossed what river? Jordan. And then the next book is? Joshua. The next book is what? Say Joshua. Joshua. Joshua conquered the promised land after Joshua di died. Then God started picking individual rulers, and they were called, judges. say, judges. judges. And the judges period lasted about 300 years. The judges period lasted from the time Joshua died. He was the, the leader. Before him was Moses. And after Joshua died, God started picking individual leaders like Samson and Gideon and Deborah to lead. They were judges. And that lasted for about 300 years. And that ended when, we came, we, when Israel got their first king, King Saul. King who? Saul. Who was the first king? Saul. Who was the first king? Saul. Say Saul. Saul. Say Saul three times. Saul, Saul, Saul. Very good. And Saul became king in the book of 1 Samuel. So we are now in the book of 1 Samuel, ending the book of the period of Judges. So you got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They crossed the what river? Jordan. And the next book was who? Jordan. And the next book was about what? Jordan. And the book after that was Ruth. Ladies, say Ruth. 
And then it happened. Very good. Thank you very much. And then, and then now we're in the book of 1 Samuel. There's two Samuels, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. In the original Hebrew Bible, it was one book. And, and, and it was named after a guy named Samuel. And we're going to talk today about his mother, Hannah. Everyone say Hannah. Hannah. Say Hannah. Hannah. Who in here can tell me the, the company that makes the cartoons that says Hannah? Hannah who? Hannah Barbera, they make the cartoons. So this is a different lady, a uh, different person, but just want to throw that little, little cartoon trivia on you. And here's the story. In the book of 1 Samuel, you have all these transitions. You have a transition from judges to kings. God leadership to man leadership. That was all what the king was about. We wanted a man leader. David transitions from a shepherd to a giant killer. The Ark of the Covenant goes from Shiloh to the Philistines, then back to Israel. You have all the, uh, uh, um, Saul goes from king elect to king reject. So you have all these transitions in this book, all from to. And every week we're going to have a from to. Today we're going to talk about going from having unanswered prayer or weak prayer to powerful prayer. How many of y'all would love to have a powerful prayer life? Raise your hand real quick. Okay, very good, very good, very good. Okay, how many of y'all have... Many or multiple prayers right now that you're praying that you would like God to answer. Very good. We're going to tell you today, hopefully, how you can get those prayers answered today. Now, it's very critical for you to look on the back of your lesson plan. I want to show you something. Every week during this series, we're going to have this little chart. It's a from to chart. And if you write, if you have a pen, right after the word from and right after the word to, write the word doing. Write the word doing. In other words... While I'm speaking, we have the lesson plan on the other side, the fill-ins, but God hopefully is going to speak to you specifically about something you need to change in your prayer life, or it may, not, it may be something unrelated as well, but specifically your prayer life that you need to go from doing something or not doing something to doing something. Example, you, as I'm talking, you may think, you know what, I need to go from not praying at all <laughs> to start praying. It may be something that basic. Or I may mean to go from, from, from just praying once a week to every day. But God's going to speak something specifically to you. My encouragement to you is that you listen for it. That you tell God, God, speak to me about my life. Amen? Okay, very good. Here's the story. Hannah, she cannot have a baby. She's been praying to God, praying to God, praying to God. I want to have a baby. I want to have a baby. She is sterile or barren. Many women in the Bible who were barren, Elizabeth, Rachel, Rebecca, they were all barren. And they were all a prelude to Jesus' mother, Mary, who not only, she wasn't barren, she never was with a man. So it was all laying a foundation for, the, for the, uh, Jesus, Mary's virgin birth. So Hannah cannot have a baby. And she's praying to God, praying to God, praying to God. We're going to see in a minute she was in anguish and she was a bitterness of soul. It was driving her crazy. And then she is going to do something or several things. That is going to unlock the key to answered prayer. I want you to be thinking about your prayer. And this principle is going to apply to all your prayer requests. But if you just focus on one or whatever. But I want you to think about your prayer. I want you to be thinking, God, tell me what you want me to do. Tell me how to apply these one or all of these five principles we're going to talk about. And, and we'll see what happens to your prayer. Let's read chapter 1, verse, 1 Samuel, verse 8. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better than ten sons to you? In other words, why are you tripping on having a baby? You got me. <laughs> then Hannah arose and smacked her husband upside his head. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What kind of knucklehead is that? <laughs> you know what's so great about the Bible? is that the Bible doesn't, like, make everybody in the Bible perfect. It, it's really the opposite. It tells you to, that, that, I mean, that's a dumb statement, okay? But that's what he said, so it's in there. I mean, you know. Ladies, is that a dumb statement? <laughs> okay. So Hannah rose, smacked her husband upside the head, and after they finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, and Eli was the priest, was sitting on the seat of the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And when she was of bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. How many of you have had a prayer request? You found yourself bitter or in bitterness of soul. 
and in anguish, and God was not answering your prayer, guess what? You're okay. You're okay. Welcome to the club. That is where God wants you. For some of your prayers, that's where you need to be. You're going to learn in a minute why. But that is not, does not at all mean that God has forgotten you. It does not at all mean that God is late because he's never late. It doesn't at all mean that God can't do what you're asking. And it doesn't at all mean that he's going to say no, but it could be because you may be asking the wrong thing. We're going to see that in a minute. But if you find yourself in that place, that doesn't, that's not abnormal. Matter of fact, that is normal. It happens all the time. It won't happen necessarily all the time, but it happens all the time. And so here's this woman in anguish. And all she is asking for is a child. It's a basic thing. And you may be asking for something. I pray to God. I pray to God, God, I'm just asking for this simple thing I have and still am right now. Something that to me is so basic that I'm asking for, why can't you give this to me? And he is, has not said yes. And so he, he, there's, and, and there's a reason for that. Sometimes we know it, sometimes we don't. We're going to see in a minute what, what one of those reasons may be. But the point is, is that God will string you out for a very specific reason. And so don't be discouraged by it. Just keep pressing on for it. But look what it says in verse 11. And everything's going to, all these five points are going to all come from this one verse. She made a vow. Everyone say vow. You are hopefully going to make a vow on the back of this sheet. God, I am going to do this differently. Because I believe from what I heard today that you want me to do this. If you make a vow, keep your vow. Ecclesiastes 5.5 5 says it's better not to vow than to make a vow and not keep it. It is better not to vow at all than to make a vow and not keep it. She makes a vow and she keeps it. Look what it says. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you indeed look on the affliction of your servant, and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child. Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. Number one in your notes, you must acknowledge that God is active in your life right now. You must acknowledge that God right now is active in your life. He is involved in your life. I want to look at the verbs. Everyone say verbs. If you remember from English class, I'm, uh, English was my worst subject. English, verb is an action word. Look at the action words in this verse. Let's read it again. Verse 11. She made a vow. O Lord of hosts, if you will look. Say look. On my affliction. And remember me. Remember. Say remember. Amen. Say not forget. not forget. And but will give him. Say give. give. These are action words. Every single one of you cannot forget this one thing is that God has not separated himself from you and left you to yourself. He is actively working in your life. I was, yesterday my daughter came to me, there's a, there's a park behind my house, and a lot of times football players that work out, or a buddy of mine who works these guys out from the NFL, works out behind my house so we can see him. And so my daughter says, there's a guy out there, they're working out, and, and they're filming somebody. So I looked over the fence, and it was a guy that I hadn't seen in about six months, so I drove down there. And got him, uh, we sat down and talked after he finished his workout for about a half an hour in the car. So we're talking, chit-chatting for about five minutes. And then he goes on for about 15 minutes just complaining about the team he just came off of and how the guys on the team turned on him, guys that he had helped. And they turned on him and turned the new coaches against him. It was just, you know, drama, 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 drama. And I was sitting there just, <laughs> I mean, I really don't care. <laughs> so I just let him vent, let him vent, let him vent. He was a Christian guy. And then I said, okay, let's stop right here. I said, you know what? I have to tell you something. God is trying to teach you something with all of what you just described. Number one, everything you just described, it's really not exactly how you see it. I don't know any of what happened, but I always know there's always two sides to every story, number one. Number two, you're going to retire in about four years, a multimillionaire, 30-something years old, and you can do anything with your life you want. You should be happy. <laughs> you should be enjoying it. 
Look at all these teams you got to play for, all these people you got to meet, all these places you got to go. You work six months out of the year. And, and, and God has blessed you so much, and the devil has you distracted with all this drama about people you don't even work with anymore. You don't got to deal with any of them. I says, you need to understand that God is trying to teach you something about you and your relationship through that experience. And I'm going to tell you what one of them is. You need to stop wanting to argue and be right all the time. Because you always want to be right versus do right. And there's a difference. Sometimes we want to argue for the sake of winning the argument instead of doing right. And sometimes doing right is not arguing at all. It's just walking away. And I says, you, you, you're so wound up and you are, look at you, you're so upset right now and it has nothing to do with you anymore. That's over. It's over. Long gone. And so I want to encourage you to let it go. Matter of fact, I want to, I want to encourage you when you leave this car today that you leave this burden behind. And you never, ever, ever bring this up again. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> and I want to remind you, we've had this discussion before <laughs> about this very same thing. So we had this talk, and, and I prayed for him. And then I said, the one more thing I want to tell you is that, you know, God sent me down here to talk to you about this. Because if my, if my daughter didn't tell me that you were out here, I wouldn't have come out here. And God sent me down here to talk to you about this. Why? Because he cares for you. God cares for every single one of you. And every single day, all the time, God is trying to minister to you and talk to you. And you're praying and asking for this thing. And God is speaking to you all these different ways, directly and indirectly, about this thing. And you don't see it. In other words, when you're at work or at school, undoubtedly God speaks to you and says, go pray for that person. Go invite that person to church. Go encourage that person. Do you all hear that? Yes or no? Yes. yes. And some of you all do it and some of you don't. That right there is part of the answer to the prayer over here. That's how it works. You being obedient over here is related to your prayer over here. Because what you're praying over here, you don't know what the answer is. You, don't, you really don't even know what you're asking. You have a desire. You think, well, if I get this, it'll meet my desire. But you really don't know the whole story. And what God's trying to tell you is that if you obey me over here, I'll show you this. And so every day he's trying to communicate to you. He's active in your life all the time. There's no coincidences. And so when, you, every, when you're walking around and going from here to there, school, whatever, you have to be, always have your ears open of your heart. God, what are you saying to me? And acknowledge that he's active in your life, that he's doing something in your life. He's trying to lead and guide and direct you and redirect you and teach you something. And by the way, even through people you don't like. Because <laughs> you will get a call from somebody. I got a call from the guy the other day. And, and actually, this is a guy who is a friend of mine. But what he was telling me, I didn't want to hear. And he's like, hey, brother. And here's what he said. This is none of my business. And I was like, you're right. It wasn't in his, but, but here's what I need to tell you. Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, I got to go. <laughs> Y'all been there? <laughs> I don't want to hear it. And the whole time I'm saying I don't want to hear it, this little voice says, you need to listen. And I hung up. I was like, I don't want to hear it. And I was like, mm, he's right. I felt like the dude on the, uh, you, you, you remember the uh, Wizard of Oz, little munchkin? <laughs> I don't want to listen to him. <laughs> God will speak to you through people you don't even, not, this guy wasn't someone I don't like, but people you don't like. But you have to listen. Number two, acknowledge your position as his servant. You are the servant. Verse 11. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maid servant, say servants, and remember me and not forget your maid what? But will give your maid what? Say servant. Say servant. Very good. Don't forget your maid servant. How many of you have children? How many of you have children? Have you had your talk with your child or have you ever had a talk with your child that is is centered around the concept of entitlement. <laughs> 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 
Parents, you know what I'm talking about? How many of you children don't know what I'm talking about? Very good. That's right. Exactly. You don't know what I'm talking about because you understand that you, you are owed something. In other words, mommy, daddy, you owe me dinner. <laughs> you owe me ice cream after dinner. You owe me my own room. You owe me my own flat screen. You owe me a phone. You owe me a car. That's called entitlement. And there are a lot of young people who think that they have a whole list of things that they are entitled to. So as parents, we have to readjust the understanding like a chiropractor readjusts someone's spine and say, you are not entitled to these things. If I don't give them to you, it doesn't make me bad. As a matter of fact, it may make me good. You're not entitled to it. It is a blessing. It is an honor. It is a privilege. It's a privilege. Privilege. Amen? Amen? God is in us is the same way. God is dad. We are the kids. We are entitled to nothing. You are entitled to nothing except the opportunity to have a relationship with him. But a lot of times we walk around thinking we are entitled. And when we pray, we have an entitlement attitude. Here's the entitlement attitude. We may not physically have our arms crossed, but our attitude's arms are crossed. Like, God, what is taking so long? How come you gave it to her and didn't give it to me? How come he gets to have one and I don't get to have one? Why do I have to pray all the time and it hasn't happened and it's been a week? <laughs> I work hard at this job. And you, and you have a demanding attitude. No, no, no. We come to verses telling God, God, I want to ask for this thing. And guess what? I'm your servant. And by the way, if you are God's servant, whatever you're asking for should be something that empowers you to serve him. Think about what you're asking for. What does it have to do with you serving God? And you may be saying, well, I'm just asking for a wife because I'm lonely. It ain't got nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with God. And you need to know that before you get the wife. Matter of fact, God may not give you the girl the woman, until you understand what the woman is for. Because your concept of what the woman is for may be completely backwards than what the Bible says. And the guy, for that matter, or the job, or the car, or the house. We are the servant, and if your job and my job is to serve God, we need to be praying for something that's going to empower me to serve God. A new concept. So take that thing you're asking that you are asking for and ask yourself, how do I serve God with it? And if you figure that out, you may be one step closer to getting it. Number three in your notes, acknowledge that how the delayed answer is changing your heart. In other words, you've been waiting and waiting and waiting. What is happening to your heart? For some people, the longer God goes not answering your prayer, the more attitudes you get. That's a bad sign. But if God is clarifying to you what to ask for, if he's humbling you, if he's making your prayers more rich and more biblical and more spiritual and more scriptural and longer, that's a good thing. What is God doing in your heart the longer you wait? I make my own breakfast every day. My wife does not make my breakfast. And I make oatmeal every day. It's the same breakfast. It's the only thing I can make. <laughs> I put, the, I measure the oatmeal out in a little measuring cup, put it in the bowl the night before, raisins in it, put water in it and soak it overnight. These are not the instant kind. These are the, the, the you know, the, the other kind. Soak it overnight. Then in the morning I get up, put one half cup of water in the, in the pot, put the cover on, turn the fire on. I used to, this is how ignorant I was, I would boil the water without the cover on. I would sit there for like five hours and the water wouldn't boil. So I had to put the cover on and kind of it heats up real quick. So I, I discovered how to boil water. I didn't know how to boil water. Water boils, put the oatmeal in, boil it, and then, you know, I put it in the bowl and let it cool down and eat it. Now, the other day, a certain individual in my house, female who lives there, adult woman, <laughs> not going to say any names, but uh, my wife was sitting there in the kitchen and she happened to comment on how soupy my oatmeal was. 
Now, I had to remind her very quickly this was my oatmeal that I make for myself seven days a week. It was basically none of her business, right? And I've been doing this for a long time, you know, a couple of years. So I was like, I know how to do this. So why are you telling me how to take the water out of my oatmeal? She said, we can pour it out in the sink. I was like, look, I know how to deal with my oatmeal. And when my, oat, my oatmeal that I make, that I measure, that I boil, don't ask any of your opinion, that when, I, when it has more water than it needs, I know how to get the water out and I don't pour it out. I have a better technique. What I do is I take the pot off the fire and I let it sit there in the pot until it evaporates off. It's a more natural, breathing, holistic way of getting the water out. <laughs> So what I do is I let the, let the pot sit there and I let the water naturally evaporate off instead of pouring it out. And then I'll go take a shower or something and it likes to cool off a little bit. And then I come back and I wait for the right consistency. Then I pour it in the, in the bowl. Are you feeling me on this? And whether you agree with that, it has nothing to do with me. This is my oatmeal and my breakfast. So what I do is I let it sit in the pot. As you wait for your prayer to be answered, God is letting you sit in the pot. And you need to know, what is God teaching me as I sit here in this pot? How is he shaping my thoughts, my mind, my perspective? Because a lot of times when we start praying for something, we're like, I got to have it, I got to have it, I got to have it. And then after a while, we're like, either, well, maybe I really don't need it. Or, you know, really what I need is this. Or, no, I'm going to really learn how to pray this through. But over time, something is happening to you. And he is waiting on purpose to show you what he's trying to teach you. He already knows your heart. He's trying to show you your heart. And for some of you, you get cranky and cop attitude, and he's going to show you how selfish you are. He's going to show you how impatient you are. He's going to show you how, how futile and flighty you are. You change your mind. Oh, I'm praying for this. I got to have this. And then two days later, it doesn't happen. Well, I got to have this. And two days later, I, I got And he's like, make up your mind. So you, you, what, what, what the point is, is that you need to sit back and go, step back and go, what, is, what am I learning? What have I learned? You've been praying for something for six months. Do you pray every day? Well, not really. Well, you probably really don't like it. Want it then. Then why should God give it to you? God is trying to prepare you to get that thing you're praying for. You may be praying for a woman. And I'm not saying she's shaped like this. I'm just kind of, you know, kind of a Michelin woman thing. <laughs> this is really a spirit, the spiritual aspect of her. <laughs> you're praying for this kind of a woman, and God is saying, you're not ready for this kind of a woman. And if I give her to you now, you won't. She won't go out with you. So I'm going to wait until I can do this to you. And it's going to take time because you're not even praying every day. It's going to take time because you're not using the Bible when you pray. You're not writing anything down. I talk to you every day. You never write it down.